and its philosophy of realism well known two completely opposing philosophical ideas of reality one is that everything you can observe directly and tangible is real that's reality one let's call it and the other is that reality is the ultimate truth which determines everything but it's not the same as reality one it's some underlying structure below that and it seems to me that physics started off trying to explain the first but has ended up explaining the second it's become more and more abstract and this has been the case ever since newton's work uh, who made it very much more abstract than it had been before and quantum mechanics takes this to an extreme um, I'm very much in favour of this, by the way, but uh, I'm saying that this is what it does. So there's no such thing as an electron with known coordinates in space and time, only a probability amplitude. There's no path of a particle, only the sum of all possible paths. And as we get more and more deeper into physics, higher energies, reality one becomes less and less evident and reality two begins to take the centre stage. So we, we can, of course, still relate theoretical description to experimental results, because if we couldn't, we couldn't do physics. But it gets less direct and more complicated. So the forces, as a, James has mentioned, really, the forces and particles describable by gauge fields, which are more like abstract mathematics than physical reality. And even though we seem to get experimental results which are tangible, we, we, and we still find it useful to talk about real particles hitting real detectors and all that kind of thing. It, it's, it, it's, still a, it's still not what is really happening. So it, it could be that sometimes when we're trying to describe physics using reality one, we're deceiving ourselves and preventing ourselves from a, achieving a better understanding using reality two. And I think a possible case is the conflation between the quarks of theoretical physics and the partons of experiments. We don't do experiments on quarks, we do experiments on partons. Uh, these are result of deep in elastic scattering experiments and we, we infer the meaning of these using the concept of quark. So even though these two concepts are related, they're not interchangeable with each other and it's more subtle than we often think. Um, so we need to just say, where are we with this physics? Well, we've got four fundamental forces and two types of particles. Um, quarks and leptons are, are the, the, the things that drive it. But what we call particles are just really manifestations of quantized fields. The four forces have different characteristics, different sources. And we say gravity, that's the source of gravity is mass or mass energy attraction between identical particles decreases with the square of the distance we've got three other forces gauge interactions electric strong and weak mediated by exchange particles or bosons now these happen to be different from gravity because they're repulsive between identical particles and they each have a different force law and a different associated gauge symmetry but all three have some component which is inverse square Coulombic. And this gives us the magnitude of the forces or the coupling constant, as we call it. Now, while the Coulomb force completely describes the electric, the Coulomb component dis completely describes the electric force uh, entirely, its gauge symmetry is uh, called U1. That's the mathematical group which determines the way the, the symmetry works. The the interactions, the particles, the bosons. There's only one boson, the photon, and we call that U1 symmetry. And the other two forces have additional components. So the gauge symmetries and boson exchanges are different to those from the electric. And the strong interaction symmetry is called SU3. It's in its kind of um, a vectorial type thing. It's got three components and it's we say that it takes place between quarks or antiquarks becoming three varieties known as colors. Now we know that quarks don't exist separately. They only exist in combinations of either three quarks in three different colors or a quark and an antiquark of color and anticolor. 
So quarks only exist in combinations, and we will only find those combinations. Three quark combinations, protons, neutrons, generally known as baryons. Quark-antiquark -quark combinations known as mesons. And the SU3 symmetry requires eight exchange bosons, which are called gluons. So we have eight gluons. That if it's because it's SU3 and not U3 uh, that we have uh, not nine, but three by three, but three squared minus one equals eight. And the remaining force, the weak interaction, is characteristic of all leptons as well as quarks, all fermions. It's the thing that de determines whether the thing is a fermion. If it interacts weakly, it's a fermion. And it's characterized by an SU2 symmetry and acts as a creator and destroyer of fermions and antifermions. So fermions and antifermions can annihilate or combine to produce a boson, or a boson can split up to produce a fermion, antifermion pair. And the SU2 symmetry, again, it's two squared minus one. It's not two squared, three exchange bosons. And James has talked about the Ws and Z. And there are three that manifest themselves, W naught, W minus, and Z naught. And these are the only exchange bosons which have masses. All other gluons, photons, and so on, all don't have um, masses. Only Ws and Z have masses. Now, the weak interaction is com completely different from the others in being spin dependent. It, uh, it only works for left handed fermions. It doesn't work for right handed fermions. And it only works for right handed fermions. It doesn't work for left handed fermions, anti fermions. Now, I'm going to use a deeper level, which I've talked about many times, and say that the sources of the three gauge interactions we described as. Uh, forms of a parameter which we can cr call charge. Now, I used to use this many years ago, 30 odd years ago, ages ago, so long ago that uh, I don't care to remember. And people used to say, you can't call it that. But I see everybody calls it that now. Electric charge is the source of the electric force. But there seems to be something else which we could call strong and weak charges, which are responsible for the three symmetries, U1, SU3, SU2. And to me, a lot of confusion comes about because people have not fully appreciated that these charges are totally independent in their actions from each other. I know we have electroweak unification, but it doesn't mean that electric sources and weak sources are, uh, are inseparable. They are not the same sources. It's reinforced by experimental results like baryon and lepton cons conservation. They tell us that these three charges are different. Theories which have tried to violate this principle seem to always come to grief. I'll say more about it later. Now, I say charge is one of the most important concepts in physics. It's a fundamental concept. It's, it's when you do... Um, Analysis, dimensional analysis, you, you need to include charge as well as space, time and mass. And I don't mean just electric charge, I mean any charge. If we don't understand charge, we will not understand physics. These four parameters I have shown previously are a group of order four. Anyway, the fundamental nature of this quartet and the three independent relationships it is comes, up, comes out in the famous um, Planck units for these, for these uh, quantities. We have three fundamental constants, g, h, bar, and c. And if we combine them in various ways, we get a length, time, a mass, and a charge. And the, these are the kind of fundamental units. And this is a diagram drawn by my um, colleague, Vanessa, who's here, uh, showing the symmetry that I've long since uh, realized exists between these four parameters. But we don't need to talk about that too much at the moment. There is a way which this symmetry breaks, and this leads us into a lot of interesting things. We've got four parameters, each has its own algebra. And I'm talking about charge in a sort of global sense at the moment. So charge is represented in this algebra by a quaternion structure, spaced by a vector structure, but it's not a 
It's not an ordinary vector. It's um, it's a quaternion-like vector. So you get um, areas, and you get volumes, you get um, pseudo vectors and pseudo scalars from this kind of vector. It's a Clifford algebra vector. Time is a scalar, as in relativity. Mass is mass meaning mass energy, not meaning discrete mass. Mass energy is a uh, scalar and mass energy uh, is just, yeah, it's just a scale. So what we can do is to put one of each of those charges, I, J, L, K, onto the other three components. And we get an interesting hybrid system. We get I, K, we get I, I, J, I, and K, I, and we get I, J. Now, what's happening here is that if you look at the, the red units now, their symmetry has been broken. The, the K and the J and the I no longer uh, are associated with the same sort of algebraic object. They've each got a different algebraic object. Now, this algebra of those five units or even of those eight units, in fact, is identical to the gamma algebra of the Dirac equation. When you multiply all those out, you get 64 possible units, exactly as in the Dirac algebra, and it has the same purpose. And the, the IK object is like the gamma naught of the Dirac algebra. These three here are like the gamma, and the last one is like the gamma, sorry, the I, the, uh, yes, is the gamma five. Yes, the last one is the gamma five. So you create, to actually create this algebra, what, what you find is those five are generators of the 64 unit group. And those five have to have a broken symmetry in the minimum representation, which is five. You could take six or you could take eight, but the minimum representation is five. And as soon as you do that, they have to be broken. And the thing that gets broken is the red units, the charge. And this I've shown it previously elsewhere. This is reflected in the SU2, which comes from the IK for the weak interaction. The SU3 comes from the, the, the three components connected with the red I, and the, the, the J is the U1, remaining U1. It also creates the characteristics of what we call energy, momentum, and rest mass. We started off with space, time, mass, and charge, and now we've got new units. Energy has, has the properties associated with this. Momentum has the properties associated with that. And the, the, uh, the, the mass now is a rest mass, a discrete mass, not the original mass energy. And if you multiply the, the, the units, the IKE the, and the Ps on the, the I, I, J, I, J, I, and so on, and the JM, and you multiply two of these together, you get zero because you get Einstein's relativistic energy equation, E squared minus P squared minus M squared equals zero. So I want to now mention about the standard model. The forces and particles that exist in fundamental physics make up what we call the standard model. And it's been around since 1973, very close to its finished form early on. There are three generations of particles, more or less duplicating each other. And the first generation has an up in three colors, electric charge two thirds E. A down charge in three colors of electric charge minus one third E. Whereas E is the charge on the electron. So electron has a negative electric charge minus E and an electron neutrino has a zero electric charge. And it was significant, we know later that the total of these squared is gonna be 16 over three squared. So this is the particles of the standard model. The, the, the three generations, that's the first generation. That's the second and that's the third. And there's two, there are two sets of three colored quarks, U in three, three colors, D in three colors, and then there's the electron and the electron neutrino, and that's duplicated twice. And these are the gauge bosons, the gluons of which there are eight, the photon, which is one, and 
one of those and two of those on the Higgs finally. And this is the most successful theory ever devised. Fantastic piece of work completed about 1973 and not very much has happened since to change it. I have colleagues who've spent their whole career trying to break this model and they just do experiments and they say, oh, standard model again. Every time they get standard model. And if we want to calculate the results of an experiment in a particle collider, we have equations which we can solve iteratively to take it to the order of magnitude desired. And we know how all the fundamental fields work. And we know all the interacting particles. We know how these things happen, but we don't know why. Why do we have four interactions, gravity and three different ones, three gauge ones, seemingly different force laws and gauge ones? And why, why, why are they different and how, do, how can they possibly connect? Well, there were two things that happened to help us get somewhere with this. And in the 1960s, there was Glashow-Weinberg-Salam theory, which James has explained to us already in you know, considerable detail. And the second was the possibility of grand unification of the three gauge forces, which was due to George and Glashow. So we've got to the electric weak theory. I can do it very briefly. The, the, the electric and weak interactions are combined mathematically in an SU2 times U1 gauge group. And that combines three original weak fields, W1, W2, and W3, and the weak hypercharge field B into the familiar. This is the mixing that James was talking about, familiar W plus W minus and Z0 and the massless gamma. We still end up with four, with four but there are different four. It's specifically between W3 and B, which creates the new field of Z0 and gamma. And the mixing quantified by the mixing angle, theta W sine squared, fixes the ratio of charge squared for the weak and electric interactions. And the cosine defines the mass ratio of W and Z. Now, current measurements give us sine squared theta W is 0.231 and energy is close to the value of W and Z masses. So this is non-unit, and it, we, we should be careful about implying electric and weak forces come from a single force. Some authors say that, but I don't agree with it. They're not from a single force, they're a combined force. It's a combination, not a, a single thing. Just as space and time is a combination in relativity and not a single thing. So we have electric and weak forces often behave as though they were a single force, but they're not. They're connected, but they have different sources and they don't have the same coupling constant. So connected doesn't mean interchangeable. We can't remove a, we can't make a neutrino into an electron. A neutrino does not have an electric charge and we can't force it into having one. So that was the first development. The second development was grand unification. And this became possible because though charges are conserved as units, so we can count the number of units, they're at the values in energy terms and the, the energy that they produce in fields, uh, in energy of interaction varies with the strength of the field. And this is because a particle like an electron can polarize the vacuum around it, producing virtual electron positron pairs, and then they can produce further, further pairs and so on ad infinitum. And we sum the whole thing up in, um, in QED. And all gauge forces act in this way. Now, it seems that, that it would be hopelessly um, uncalculable, but not so. The potentially infinite series of interactions can be shown to yield a finite sum using the process we call renormalization. And the parameter that we're going to use is called the fine structure constant for the interaction. The electric one is very well known. Alpha Alpha, the electric, equals E squared over H bar C. I'm ignoring 4 pi epsilon naught. That's just units. And the, the 1 over value is 1 over 137.0359. And that was of great interest to Ampert and still is. So it's the, basically the ratio of the charge squared to the square of the Planck charge. Now, the charge response for each interaction is given by its own fine structure constant. There's alpha 2 for the weak and alpha 3 for the strong. There's even alpha g for the, elect for the gravitational, but uh, that's, that's a different um, 
thing entirely. And if we've got a particular energy, let's call it mu, then it has a value determined by its renormalization. And that the way that, that it depends, the in these equations, these two equations here, the last term, the the figure before the logarithm, the five over six pi, the seven over four pi, that is just first order, but but it's the first order equation for each of the two forces. And those values are determined by the actual characteristics of the field, SU2, SU3, and so forth. So that's why they're different. Alpha big G here is grand unification. And it's assumed that there is an alpha G at grand unification, which would be the same for all the forces if we could make them unified. And MX, M subscript X would be the grand unification energy scale. And alpha, uh, as mentioned, that's the fine structure constant to that one. So mu is just the energy scale of measurement. So that those equations show to first order how those fine structure constants vary over different energies. And these two, interestingly, we show that they decrease because the minus there, whereas the, the fine structure constant for the electric interaction increases. So if one increases over time and over energy and the others decrease, maybe if we push the energy up, they can kind of merge together. And this was put forward by George and Glashow in 1974. There's a problem that the weak coupling can't be measured directly in the same way as the other two, but we can determine it if we got the sine squared theta w, the mixing parameter. And we can find this <coughs> on the assumption that the interactions can be accommodated within a single grand unified gauge group. So this is what George and Glasher, if we can get them into a single gauge group, then we can uh, calculate sine squared theta w and we will get uh, values that converge, hopefully. And the simplest group they could find was SU5 to combine those two three groups. And so they propose a, a grand unified theory. They showed that in any grand unified scheme determined by a single grand unified gauge group, you could get one group that would fit everything in, then sine squared theta w would be given by the ratio of the sum of the squared units of the weak ISO spin. Um, which is a parameter for the weak charge, T3 equals plus or minus a half, for the fermions of the standard model to the sum of their squared units of electric charge. So that those are the sums of the um, weak over electric charges in effect. Um, since we've got eight units, weak components with only left-handed contributions, because we don't include the right-handed ones for the first generation of quarks and leptons, we, we a value for the for the weak squared um, we, we get a total value of two for the fractional electric charges of the gelman Zweig, Zweig quark model first proposed uh, in 1964 we get both left-handed and right-handed contributions because this is electric charge and it has both and so if we add all those up for the charges, we get 16 over 3, as I mentioned uh, much earlier, from which we get sine squared theta w is 0.375. And they then drew that graph. I want, I want to, you to notice that it's got alpha 1 up there. It's not got alpha. I'll mention more about that later. And this is doesn't quite merge. It's, it's very suggestive. And if you, if, you, if you look at it, it's about 10 to the 15 GeV where they merge. Interesting number because it's only a few orders of magnitude below the Planck mass, which is 10 to the 19 GeV, which is the kind of mass that you would get in quantum gravity. There were great hopes raised by this theory because of this near convergence. So as I mentioned, it's only a few orders below the Planck mass. 10 to the 19. But these hopes have not been met four de decades later. First, we never got the convergence. And secondly, the SU5 predicted a new range of XY and bosons carrying all three interactions, which seems to be 
uh, plausible at very high energies. We might not discover them for a very long time. But they also said there would be decay of the proton and they calculated the decay rate and it should have been observed and it hasn't been. And they pushed that value up by an order of magnitude uh, very often. It was 10 to the 31 GV or something. And it, it was increased by several orders of magnitude and it still hasn't been observed. And again, calculating the sine squared theta w at 0.375 it's nothing like the experimental value 0.231. So they said, oh, well, all right, we did the, the value must renormalize at higher energies. And they came up with various theories to renormalize it at higher energies to about 0.2. Then another attempt to save the situation was made by uh, Amalia et al., who invoked supersymmetry. So if you chose exactly the right amount of supersymmetry, you could twist the graphs into joining each other at about 10 to the 16 GV. Now, this has been claimed, it was claimed at the time and still is, that this is evidence for supersymmetry. And I think that's our absolute nonsense. It's not evidence for anything. It's only if supersymmetry existed, you could merge these things together. It's not evidence for it. And in fact, there's no such evidence has been found. And, uh, and the fact that it hasn't been found it makes this idea very suspect. And an influential and incisive commenter on many aspects of modern physics, Ethan Siegel, suggested that grand unification may be a dead end for physics. That was a few years ago. This is the supersymmetric model showing round about 10 to 16 merger. So should we abandon all hope? Well, when I first started investigating this, and I did some of this with a colleague, John Cullen, right early on. I put down the equations for renormalization, the three equations for the renormalization. And the thing is, I put in 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 16, and I couldn't make any sense of them. The, in fact, the equations gave me stupid answers for everything, whatever it did. And I, I thought, well, it should have been somewhere near right, but it was nowhere near right. The sine squared theta w didn't renormalize in the way suggested either, because instead of decreasing with energy, it increases, becoming 0.6 at g at grand unification, not 0.2. And I just thought, well, it, the, the supposed convergence is simply due to compensating errors. But the thing that was significant to me was if I go back to this one, for example, you see that there's this alpha one here, and that bothers me because I don't think that is. The, the interaction that we the thing that we should be looking at. It's not alpha, the elect electric interaction, it's the electroweak alpha one, it's a combination. And so you've got electroweak, weak and strong. Well, that's, you know, just not very good that to me. So instead of using the alpha, we have now alpha one, which is a combination of two. You got, um, uh, where five over three alpha one equal plus alpha two equals alpha one over alpha. Now, to me, it doesn't make sense to unify those. It makes sense to unify all three interactions, but not three, one combination and two interactions. And if we did try to use alpha, we wouldn't get, we would get even worse convergence. It wouldn't look like anything like convergence at all, which is probably why they used alpha one. But I also hope I've got a more flexible attitude about quarks than has been usual since about 1980. And this is where I need to refer to the realism which, which has started. I, I haven't the least doubt that experimental QED studies using deep and elastic scattering tell us that all up quarks behave as though they got plus two, three of the value of the fundamental unit charge while down quarks behave as though they got minus one over three. It's true at all energies, no evidence of transition at any energies, higher energies or, or, or anything. So the quark quantum numbers look like that. This is, these are the gelman Zweig model. That, that, that's the one that was first proposed. And B is saying they're sharing the, if you've got three quarks in a baryon, they're sharing the baryon number the baryon number being one for a proton or neutron. 
So I experiment that shows that QED correctly uses fractional charges. But I think we've got to remember that we're not actually investigating theoretical quarks, we're investigating experimental partons. We don't know in principle if these are fundamental or if there's really some kind of broken symmetry behind it. Is this reality one or two? Maybe they're a result of competing symmetries and I'll show how that could happen. But there are, there are problems with fractional charges anyway. So if we got to redefine the fundamental unit of charge as E over three instead of E, does this mean the electron isn't really fundamental? How could we get three repelling units together to create a electron? And how does an elementary up quark incorporate two of these? Well, I say the original now standard gelmans feig version was not the only quark model proposed. Greenberg, one of the major players, wrote in 2015, in 1965, Han and Nambu introduced a model in which an SU3 colored group is explicit. They avoided fractional electric charges by introducing nine quarks with integer charges. And this was before quark color had been um, proposed. This was the first price. This was the first proposal of color. He continued, but they paid the price that color was not an exact symmetry. Moreover, the notion of integer quarks ended up conflicting with later experimental evidence. And I say both these claims are wrong. This was the Han Nambu model. They had two integral electric charges on, say, for example, blue and green quarks, and one integral minus electric charge on the other one, say, red. And that the effectively the baryon number would be just on one quark or the other. They may have thought that color singlets might emerge at higher energies, but the color symmetry is never broken. The symmetry is exact because the strong interaction is perfectly engaged invariant and has massless bosons. So Green's, Greenberg claim that the color was not an exact symmetry is utterly incorrect. The color part is exact. And there's no problem with color because the symmetry is exact. It's entirely due to the strong force. It's nothing to do with the electric charge or any other charge. There's no problem with experiment where QED and QCD are totally independent. The theory of the strong interaction being QCD. QED phenomenology doesn't decide the question of which basic structure of charges to use or the gauge relations between the interactions. If we go for the best fit with symmetry, and if that leads to modifications in our usual practice, we should see if this has interesting consequences. Going for reality two, not reality one. And I think there is one of exceptional interest. Frank Close, a well-known textbook writer, um, a man I know quite well, wrote it, 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 back in 1979, Imagine what would happen if the color singlets were pushed up to infinite masses. Clearly only one color would exist as physical observers at all states and quark would in consequence be permanently confined. At any finite energy, we would only see the average quark charges and from which we could see, could not distinguish this from the Gelman model where the quarks form identical triplets. Now this is largely ignored now, but it's never ceased to be correct. The claim that experimental evidence is against the model is false because that experimental evidence doesn't concern the model. It doesn't concern the strong interaction at all. And in fact, I'm going to say experimental evidence is in favor of the model. Because within a few years of Close's statement came the remarkable discovery by Lachlan of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And Lachlan effectively found that an electron with charge E could attach itself to three flux lines and create a bosonic kind of state with all three, but it would only have one, elect one third of an electric charge on each one as measured. And it could also happen for five and it could also happen for five over three or three over five, many other fractional values. You could get pseudobonic bosonic combinations 
with odd numbers of magnetic flux lines and which and so become shared out between them. So if the total number of fermions, that is electrons plus flux lines is even, then collective bosonic states can form. And as I mentioned, three electrons combined with five flux lines, which is vector charges in each of three over five. Now Lachlan actually mentioned things about, <coughs> would this be relevant to the quark model? But uh, nothing was taken up at the time. This discovery could have made difference to this understanding of the quark model, but it didn't. See, Lachlan is saying that the fractional quantum model effect is fascinating for a list of reasons, but it's important, in my view, primarily for one, to establish an experiment that both particles carrying an exact fraction of electric charge E and powerful gauge forces between these particles, two central postulates of the standard models of, of elementary particles can arise spontaneously as emergent phenomena. So the Han Nambu quarks and the fractional quantum Hall effect provide us with a remarkable comparison. In each case, the QED phenomenology is de de defined by an external agent. In the first case, you've got a total gauge invariant, strong interaction, acting independently of any electric charges. That's the interaction which makes the composite baryon by combining quarks into a collective structure, which then determines its QED. In the second case, a gauge invariant weak interaction, which the Fermin boson conversion, acts independently of any electric charges. Again, the collective state of electrons and flux lines governed by the weak interaction then determines its QED. So the, Q, the QED is determined by different forces. Now, at an early stage, I thought you could get Han Nambu quarks providing a model for the strong interaction by rotating the strong charge between three possible allocations. At the same time, leptons would take up a fourth position with zero charges. And I wanted to use that to create models for the masses of particles, composite ones. Uh, I'm not going to go over that very much, but that was the model. By the 1990s, I had a baryon version of the quantum mechanical nil potent structure. I mentioned the nil potent structure earlier in the talk. And here, what I did with the strong interaction was to separate the, the P, X, P, Y, P, Z terms into three different brackets. And when you did that, assuming that, that the momentum was in only one of these states at any time, then you could get something which looked exactly like the colored quark model. Uh, I won't go into detail on it, but you could do that. So a representation like this, three component, with only one quark active at any time, in contribution to the Mangler momentum. So it seems to indicate why only a one third of baryon spin has been found due to be the valence quarks. That's a possibility the EMC experiment. And the, the rest, it becomes a vacuum observation, but I won't go into detail on that. Now, if we use this model for quarks, which is not experimentally disproved, despite repeated statements in books and papers, it is not experimentally disproved and never has been. It's just fallen out of fashion. So how would this affect the quantities observed in gauge interactions? Well, it wouldn't make any difference to the weak isospin, that would still work out at two. But it would make a difference to the electric charges, because then we would get a total of eight, and we would get sine squared theta w is 0.25, which is a much better value than 0.375. Weinberg says 0.375 is in gross disagreement, and that sure signs something wrong, but 0.25 is not in gross disagreement, and if you said it's the value maybe at the value of the Higgs field or something like that, or close to this at MW or MZ, it would be much closer. And there's also second order corrections, uh, which I noticed when uh, looking through the papers on this um, would actually make a difference in the right direction. It, it, and 0.25 is also what you get purely from leptons. So why should it be different for, a, for the electroweak parameter in the quark and lepton sectors, when the electroweak part is not different between those two sectors. 
this would allow leptons and quarks to be more unified. But there are some significant consequences because we can now produce a much simpler calculation for MX without making assumptions about the group structure. And we can avoid the electric one for the moment, whether we choose one over alpha one or one over alpha. And the hypercharge numbers for the U1 will no longer be identical to those that you would have uh, had previously. So that's the standard model so far. So if we look at those three graphs, we look at, and see that uh, the two that are closest are alpha two and alpha three, and the electric is way off. So the two that close, and they, they're getting close to 10 to the 19. If we look at those for alpha two and alpha three, because alpha two depends on sine square theta w, so when this is reduced from 0.375 to 0.25, you get a different crossing point. The crossing be point becomes higher energy. So let's use this to find the, the MX, the mass, the unification mass, the grand unification energy, um, and the alpha G, the fine structure constant, looking at the just the strong and the weak. We've got two equations which we're not messing with there. Good experimental values of alpha three and alpha, which will give us our alpha two at the energy 91.2, which is MZ. And if we solve the two equations, we val I'll obtain a value for the grand unification energy scale of 2.8 times 10 to the 19 GeV. Now that's extraordinarily close to the Planck value. And it probably is exactly the same as purely first order calculations overestimate the value of the grand unification mass. Now let's assume it is the Planck mass and do it the other way around. And we do alpha G for the all interaction would become one over 52.4 and alpha two would become one over 31.5. Exactly the kind of value we'd expect for the weak coupling with sine squared theta W close to 0.25. Can we include the electric force? We've made it work for strong and weak. Can we include the electric force? Well, as I say, the original calculation used a combined electric weak parameter. So we've got to kind of uh, un, un, deconstruct that to produce ours uh, using a, a, a different Klebsch Gordon coefficient. So the fermionic contribution to QD vacuum polarization, first equation for, and we, we will obtain if, if we, if that's the first equation is using fractional charges. We get five over three pi. If we use integral charges, we get three over pi. If we put our three over pi in the, in, into uh, uh, alpha instead of five over three pi that we originally had, then we will get a much better value. We'd also obtain a value for sine squared theta w. So we can now make direct use of this new thing with five over three pi, three over pi instead of five over three pi. And we will get, if we take GU at the Planck mass, we'll obtain one over alpha MZ squared is, is 128, which is of course the value obtained experimentally. Conversely, if we use one over alpha is 128, we'll get 1.42 times 10 to the 19. It's, it's, uh, to me, it's a striking confirmation because coincidental agreements are not going to work if you've got ex uh, expressions involving logarithmic terms. That's why the original one didn't work because there was something wrong and the one over logarithmic, one over the, the logarithmic terms pushed it way out. But it would have now appear that the unification which occurs at MX might involve a direct numerical equalization of the strengths of the three forces or even four forces, because it's at the Planck mass, the, the uh, basic idea of quantum gravity. So we can now sum up four equations. And we get sine squared theta w is another equation. And that shows the, the three equations joining at the Planck mass. That shows what happens to the electroweak mixing parameter. Starts at 0.25 and it goes up to one. 
at the mixing, the final, sorry, the final unification. And what that seems to suggest is that all four forces are reduced to scalar phases with U1 symmetry and just Coulombic interaction, just inverse square laws. All distinguishing aspects of weak and strong have gone by this time. It also leads to testable predictions because we can calculate the three coupling constant to any energy we want. And the one that's of most interest to me is the value of alpha. Because if we could, we're doing experiments at the moment at 14 TeV. Now they're not doing any QED at the moment. I'll ask them if they could, but they're not doing any of that at the moment. But at 14 TeV, alpha would have one over 118 value, not one over 125, which would come from the minimal SU5 theory of Georgian Glush. And this is a prediction which we could test reduces the number of free parameters, which is very much uh, an objective of AMPA. We get sine squared theta W from just a numerical calculation at, uh, at, at these energies. And I, what I say is the electroweak scale, uh, it is a unification, but, but the, the actual uh, weak mixing parameter is measuring the lack of unification. Because if it were if they were exactly unified, they, they, it would be one. I, I I haven't found any particular reason for the um, grand unification fine structure constant um, and such things. But but we can see that the other constants are related to each other. And I would say that probably grand unification is an asymptotic and unattainable limit. And the process would transform or break down before it reached. That's my belief. Now, all the equations are approximations. And I'm just looking to see if there's anything significant to say here. I, I can't see, uh, and th that's why you can't really calculate this one over 137 point value very easily it would take a lot of um, iterations to get anywhere near it and, and i can't find any particular reason for alpha three equals one so those are areas to look at in future we might m mention something very briefly about su5 uh, if we if th this thing is based on fives it's based on three five charges three color charges and electric and weak. It's based on five Dirac operators, five quantities, mass, momentum, and energy. And th th these all seem to be related to each other in, in by symmetrical structures like those. And you, as for the um, strong electro weak bosons, well, what I think they, they are is I think there is um, a, an amplitude for these but you, you can't see it at any energy that we can realize by experiment at the moment. And I think it's basically the same as the ordinary um, decay of the baryon and proton. I don't think the proton decays in the way they think. They thought the proton would decay to, say, a, a, something like a positron and, a, and some neutral particle. And of course, it can't do that because that would mean the strong charge would have to go to zero. It can't be done. Now, I, th I think we, you, we can uh, consider the quantum gravity, et cetera, afterwards. I think the main thing is to try to make the gauge forces um, meet. Can I mention about the what I was saying before? about Higgs mechanism to the generation of fermion masses. This Yukawa coupling to me, I, it's, it's, it's problematic because when you look at the books or the articles on it, they all invent hypercharges of one and minus one uh, for, for, these, for these particles. But if you use the fractional charges, they wouldn't have those hypercharges. If you use the integral charges, they would. And so it, they, they have to invent charges. 
to, to actually do the Yukawa coupling calculate calculation. And the elect, uh, I'll leave the leptons. Let me, let me go to my conclusion. I think granulification was one of those powerful ideas like supersymmetry, which would seem never to live up to its promise. And I think it's because people haven't taken carefully the difference between reality one and two, calculating things using a um, theoretical model and uh, doing the experimental work which might be quite different. And in the case of quarks and partons, they are. Broken symmetries, in my view, often stem from clashes between these modes of explanation. And really they develop from hidden symmetries, which is reality two, which are not directly concerned with the observations being made, reality one. And this is what I believe has happened with quarks, where the underlying group structure needed for granulification operates on different rules from the QD of observation. But we can overcome this by returning to a model proposed almost as soon as the quark theory was created, which has never been disproved, never, never at all, but simply fallen out of fashion because more immediate needs took precedence. As soon as we do, we obtain re remarkable results, credible value for the mixing parameter, granulification of the Planck mask, pure Coulombic forces of this energy, a connection with gravity, and a meaningful connection between quarks and leptons. And we have predictions that can be tested with realizable experiments. Okay, thank you very much. How do I stop sharing? Stop share. Well, thank you very much, Peter. <clears throat> I guess this is a moment where the people who've specialized in these things will have lots of questions. John Williamson, I've never known you be quiet like this. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no. But, um, so you come down on the side of Han Nambu quarks. Yeah. Uh, but, in, but not for measurement. For measurement, we're going to get thirds and two thirds. Has that been. Uh, people have measured, have tried to measure these things. I was, I was one of those people myself. But. Um, I thought that was still uncertain. Is there a certain measurement for two thirds and one thirds for these things? Well, oh, I don't. I don't know about that. I'm not an experimentalist. Okay, right here. So I, I don't really know about that. As far as I know, they've they've said it is two thirds and one thirds, but but the thing oh, is, no, that's I, just I know that's just that's partons anyway. It's not quarks. You're, you're not wrong. Quarks and partons are uh, are often treated interchangeably, but they are absolutely not so. Uh, you, you get you, you get high momentum transfer scattering and deep elastic scattering, but but that that's not on quarks and certainly not in the very high multiplicity things that are, that are those high energies. I think the problem. I, I'd be very surprised if people had managed to distinguish the two thirds and one third. I was just having a quick look, but couldn't find anything on that. I'm going to chase it further. I'd be surprised because. Uh, um, you tend to, when you get to higher energies, get to very, very high multiplicities, and those things are charge neutral. So the valence quarks end up carrying only a tiny fraction of the total momentum of the of the uh, of, of the uh, of the proton if you're looking inside uh, the stable baryon. So um, it's quite a it's a very difficult thing to do, and it gets more difficult at higher energies. So, um, but I'll try and find evidence of that. that I found one paper on measurement of the top quark charge, but I'm going to investigate that one. I think. Uh, just briefly. And May I ask, do you, do you guys live in the same physical location, more or less? Liverpool <laughs> University or something? I mean, this could no, be uh, done. Well, okay. I'm at Liverpool, John's at Glasgow. Or... I, I'm Glasgow, so it's not that far apart. No, it's, no, it's okay. not too down the route to me. No, we've, I uh, think, we've... Bar Barbara, are you trying to say something? No, no. Okay. You've got a little red button against you. Does that mean you're the host or something? Possibly. I don't see the red button though here. Okay. James has got a question. Then I think James should speak. He has to unmute. Hello? There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to talk about experiments that were done when I was a grad student and, uh, and I think subsequently at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. They uh, took 
electrons and positrons and collided. So the coupling is always purely electromagnetic. You don't have to worry about anything confusing. And then they, they uh, took the ratio of electron positron to everything. So that as you go through particle creation thresholds, Edge you're there. getting a pure electromagnetic coupling at the threshold. So in other words, how strong the coupling is, is proportional to the square of the charge. Understand that's, that's quantum electrodynamics. So yes. the coupling is proportional to the square of the charge. They in fact, now, now I completely agree that generations flavor eigenstates uh, mix generations. So in other words, flavor color eigenstates are not mass eigenstates, but the experiments uh, that measure uh, couplings that produce thresholds. So in other words, it's flat, then a new particle, then flat, then a new particle, then flat. Uh, when you create, a, a, say, a, 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 a muon, mu plus, mu minus, there was an integral step. When you created, uh, when you uh, created hadrons that must have come from up, anti up, it was four ninths. It really was. It's four oh ninths. no, I, bl I believe it is, and I believe it always four will be. And, and and when it was down, anti down, it was one ninth. But what, when you have the, the the fractional quantum hole effect, you have fractional charges, but there aren't any fractional electrons. Well, well, I, I'm I'm agreeing. I'm I'm just saying that whatever yes. is going on. Whatever's inside of there, you, um, you're, you're creating things that are stable. So in other words, it's flat afterwards. And the coupling is, if, uh, since it's a purely electromagnetic coupling, that's what charge is. Charge is how yeah. electromagnetism couples. What I'm... Uh, goes in steps of four ninths, square root of four ninths, and square root of one ninth. Yeah, what I'm saying is that will happen because the strong interaction is gauge invariant. It can't tell which color it's, it's interacting with. And so it will be a third in, when it comes to the electric, electromagnetic. Well, when, when I was an undergraduate, I, uh, I was fortunate to be in a, an experimental group that was working on discovering what wound up being the charm quark, uh, which is Kabibo mix. So I, I completely agree that there's mixing, there's Kabibo mixing so that, so that the generations mix. Uh, flavor eigenstates are not uh, mass eigenstates. That's completely true. Uh, that was needed, in fact. And subsequently, top and bottom, as, a, as another gener uh, generation were discovered. So I, I'm not disagreeing with that. Actually, uh, the, uh, if it was a single mass, it would be SU3, but you're having masses that mix, Kabibo mix, just like uh, the W and the B are mixing. Uh, so what's experimentally found is that uh, it agrees with what you're saying, but still, the generations, the up is, uh, uh, is, uh, is two-thirds and the down is, is one-third, as far as this electromagnetic coupling. Yep. And, uh, oh, okay. I, I think it should be. I think it should be, because it, the electromagnetic interaction does not depend on the strong interaction. It's, that's a totally separate thing. Well, that's what you're saying. Hey, Peter, I think you're getting close to getting an agreement with an experimental guy this is really this is amazing quite could happen yeah yeah right <laughs> is anybody else waiting to Lou, like you to usually have a question ah philip yeah i'd like to um ask peter um wh what he thinks the unity of his physical abstract uh, mathematics is is kind of pointing to and well, the first thing is that it's all a totality zero. Hmm. If, if you get this level of symmetry at the fundamental level, it's because nothing can exist without its opposite in some way. And it's, it's, it's a combination between two symmetries, one of which is um, duality, plus minus, etc., and the other one is anti-commutativity, which gives you all the three-dimensional aspects. And any aspect involving threeness comes from anti-commutativity. Hmm. And so, yeah, anti-commutativity also helps to create duality. It's not totally separate. 
So would you say it, it's uh, representing how things appear? So how things go through separation in order to... Um, I'm not sure what your question means. Things... Um, I'm, I'm talking about what ought to be the underlying structure, the abstract structure behind it. You have to have an abstract structure, and that abstract structure ought to have this symmetry, and the symmetry will appear in many different ways and it will manifest itself all the time in lots of different ways. Hmm. Yeah, okay. And, I'm and, sure uh, I can be any clearer on that. Yeah, no, that's very clear. Um, so, so, so I was just trying to um, ask you a question whether, because it's simply an abstract unification. Yes. That um, w w would you kind of um, identify it uh, with, with that material world in, in that? Yeah. Well, the, yeah. Mater the material world depends on the symmetry for its characteristics, and and uh, it do they do manifest themselves. We do see those symmetries manifesting, hmm. and the material world often manifests itself in a broken symmetry where you get a competition between two symmetries and we often see that and it's and there's no such i mean this i don't think there's any such mechanism as symmetry breaking as such i think it's already broken you know when we when we perceive it hmm. and the reason why it's broken is because you've got competing symmetries in the abstract realm but would you say it's broken symmetry in our understanding? Would you say it's 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 um, it's pointing to a kind of an objective reality or a reality that is coming into being through this symmetry that you're? Describing? I think it's the reality coming into being through the yeah. symmetry. Yeah. Not some other reality. No. Mm. So it's a kind of dynamic. Yeah. Mm. And which is why quantum mechanics is a such a great theory because you can get very close to the abstraction hmm. okay thank you very much barbara yes over to you i think it's uh 